Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about biodiversity conservation. Topic for the day is going to be causes of decline. So as always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe each of the major causes of biodiversity loss, and finally provide representative examples of animals affected by each major cause. Lots of words, but the major topic for the day is going to be the things that cause declines in biodiversity. So the best way to begin might be to talk about those things so that you can kind of get them into your brain. Throughout this unit, we're going to be talking about declines in biodiversity. That's obvious. That's easy. There are five major things that have been shown to be the uh, driving forces behind losses in biodiversity. The first one is habitat loss, alien species, overharvesting, pollution, and climate change. The rest of this video, I'm going to go through each one of those, talk about it in some detail, give you a couple of examples, and once we've talked about climate change, that's your video for the day. So first major cause of declines in biodiversity is habitat loss, and this is the greatest cause of biodiversity loss. Usually, habitat loss is the result of human development or human use of materials. So humans build things and we build over things. If we need lumber, we're going to go to a forest and we're going to cut lumber. If we need to do landscaping, we're going to go into a habitat and pull out the plants that we need. If we need to build houses, then we're going to destroy whatever habitat we build those houses and buildings over the top of. So as humans grow and expand, as our population spread out across the land, we are going to need to build homes for all those people and businesses and things like that. Problem is, the animals that live in those areas are going to suffer because as we build our homes, they lose their homes. And some major species that you need to know about that have been negatively impacted by habitat loss um, include several animals and I want to just say in general specialist animals are at the greatest risk so animals that are particularly adapted to one small area and that is the only area that they are adapted to are going to be at the greatest risk for extinction because of habitat loss because that's the area they're adapted to so if that area changes then they're not going to be able to move on to somewhere else one of the main species that is pointed to when scientists talk about habitat loss is the northern spotted owl. Uh, it lives up and down the west coast of America and up into Canada and primarily it lives in old growth forests which are forests that are hundreds of years old have huge trees. The owls nest in those huge trees but as people have developed up the west coast obviously the trees that those owls live in have been cut down so owl species or owl Population densities have greatly decreased. Some others to know about would be migratory birds because as birds migrate, they have stopping points along the way. If people develop over the top of those stopping points, usually wetlands, then obviously the birds aren't going to be able to stop there anymore. And then there's also the Florida panther, which I talked about in a previous video. It used to range across most of the southeastern United States, and now it's confined to one little spot down in the Everglades in South Florida. Next major cause of habit or not of habitat loss of biodiversity decline I want to talk about is alien species and an alien species is any species living in an area where it's not supposed to be. You need to know that alien species and exotic species are interchangeable words. When I say an exotic species I'm not talking about something that came up out of the tropics. I'm just talking about an animal that is living outside of its home range. So every animal has got the area where it evolved, the area that it is native to. If that animal gets moved to somewhere else it has become an alien or an exotic species. These uh, exotic species are such a problem because once they get taken to a new area they usually don't have any predators they may be very well adapted to utilize the resources in that environment. So because they don't have any predators and they can use the resources very well, they rapidly reproduce and take over an area, taking resources away from the animals that are native to that area. If an exotic species spreads out and starts becoming very prominent in an area, then it is known as an invasive species. So exotic species become invasive species. And next slide is going to give you several examples of invasive species that you need to know about. Some of the major ones that you could use as an example when you're talking about this is kudzu. Kudzu is a vine that is native to Japan. It was brought over to America, particularly the southeast, as an ornamental plant. And farmers were encouraged to plant it in order to produce or to prevent erosion on their fields. So good thing we're preventing erosion. 
Problem is, kudzu is very well adapted to the environment of southeastern United States, and it can grow up to a foot a day. So it has taken over the U.S. Um, I've been in the South for about eight or nine years, lived in Florida, North Carolina. You see kudzu everywhere. <clears throat> it grows up and over trees and kills them, grows over wildflowers. Anything that is in its way, it just grows over the top of, blocks sunlight, takes resources, and kills off those plants. Another one to know about is zebra mussels. Now, Oddly enough, you need to know a little bit about shipping to understand these guys. Um, big container ships, when they don't have any cargo, they have to take on water in order to weight them down so that they are stable. That water is known as ballast water. So what a ship might do is it may be in Asia, empty cargo, nothing on board, so they pump in a bunch of that ballast water from whatever sea they are in in Asia. They travel to the United States, they load up their cargo, because they've got cargo, they don't need the water to weight them down anymore, so they let all that water from Asia out into the American rivers and streams and lakes, the port that they're in, and whatever was sucked up in Asia has now been transported to America. One invasive species that came to America this way is the zebra mussel. Now, zebra mussels, you can see them there on the right, do have one benefit in that they're really good at filtering water. So they've become very prominent in the Great Lakes region of America. They filter the water, which is great, <clears throat> excuse me, but some Great Lakes species need the algae that they're filtering out of the water, so those animals aren't able to get the algae that they need anymore. Also, the zebra mussels um, proliferate very quickly and can clog pipes and take over habitats. There's also silver carp, which is an Asian carp species that has come to America, has a very interesting habit in that when it's disturbed, it jumps out of the water. Now, these fish can be up to 40 pounds, and they can jump up to 10 feet out of the water. So if you are a boater going across a lake, uh, I believe it's up in the Midwest in America, these fish can fly out of the water and knock you out of your boat. Um, also, there's concerns that they might outcompete native species. Also, a concern with pythons and the Everglades. So people got, you know, baby boa constrictors, they decided, hey, the snake's getting really big. I can't hold on to it anymore, so they released it in Florida. Problem is, South Florida was a perfect habitat for these pythons that are now overtaking the Everglades. They may end up competing with gators as top predators. We don't know what's going to happen with them because it's a fairly new phenomenon. So when you talk about invasive species, make sure that you know each of those. Overharvesting would be the next major cause in biodiversity decline that you need to know about. And this is just removal at a rate faster than replacement. So you take them away faster than they can regrow. Some of the major species that have succumbed to overharvesting, and there are a lot of them, but some of the ones you need to know about is the dodo bird, flightless bird. You saw his picture on the last slide. Lived on islands in the South Pacific. When traders and mariners would come to those islands, they say, hey, there's all of these birds. The birds had never seen humans before, so they're not uh, scared of them. So uh, sailors hunted for dodos. Within 80 years, the dodo became extinct. Same thing probably happened with the giant mammoths. Um, there used to be camels in North and South America. Not anymore. Passenger pigeons, same thing. And then we've got large game animals like rhinos and elephants and hippos and giraffes and things like that. So humans like to hunt things. Problem is we hunt things at rates that are unsustainable and when we hunt things at a rate that is unsustainable then that thing becomes extinct. Now there has been some work done to put laws in place to discourage the hunting and over harvesting of animals and there's two major ones you need to know about. There's the Lacey Act which was enacted in 1900 in America and it prohibited the interstate sale of endangered species or illegally harvested species, so that would be America. And then internationally, there is the CITES Act. Um, I'm not going to go through what CITES stands for, but essentially CITES makes trade in illegally harvested or endangered or exotic animals illegal. So you cannot internationally trade animals that have been taken illegally or are on this red list that you see right there. The organizations that um, kind of enact and enforce CITES, keep a red list. The red list contains endangered and exotic species. If those species are caught being traded, then the people trading them obviously will have uh, penalties and probably jail time to go along with that. Problem is, even with these laws, the black market trade in exotic animals is somewhere between five and twenty billion dollars a year, with most of the animals going to Asia for medicine and America for pets. Two or three final things to finish up with. 
pollution is a major cause of biodiversity loss. Ecosystems and their animals are sensitive. Ecosystems and the animals in them have adapted to particular conditions and niches. If you wreck those conditions and niches with pollution, they're done. A big example of this would be coral bleaching in the ocean. When pollutants get into the ocean, it kills off the algae and the uh, coral polyps that build coral reefs. Once those algae and the polyps die, then the coral reef dies and everything that lived in that habitat takes off and you're left with white coral just like that. Last one, last slide for the day is going to be climate change. Animals are adapted to a certain niche. They each have their role in the ecosystem. They are used to certain abiotic and biotic conditions that their ancestors have evolved to meet over the course of hundreds or thousands of generations. As the climate changes, their environments are going to change. If the animals aren't able to migrate, then they will go extinct. Now, in many cases, the animals are going to be able to migrate from one place to another. But if that's not possible, as is the case with our polar bears then, then the animal is probably going to go extinct. And that's it. When you go back to this video, make sure that you can talk about each of the major causes of climate change. Also, make sure that you can give a couple of example animals as representative species. With that, thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully, we'll see you again.